Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live webinar, Bridge Erection, a Construction Engineer's Perspective, presented by Dave Rogowski and Josh Crane of Genesis Structures. My name is Nate Goner for AISC Education, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. I would like to introduce today's speakers. Dave Rogowski is principal and owner at Genesis Structures, a structural consulting services firm in Kansas City, Missouri. He has 32 years of experience, including 14 years in HNTB's Longspan Bridge Design Division and 16 years at Genesis. He holds a BS in Architectural Engineering and an MS in Civil Engineering from Kansas State University. Our second speaker, Josh Crane, is a senior engineer at Genesis. He has nine years of experience at the firm. He is an active member at, on the ASCE Temporary Structures Committee and serves as an adjunct professor at the University of Kansas. He holds both a BS and MS in Civil Engineering from the University of Kansas. Thanks for being here, gentlemen. And I'll now turn things over to Dave to get our presentation started. All right, Nathan, we're going to go ahead and get this thing shared here. Give us just a second. All right, hopefully Nathan, everyone should see our screen now. Yep, we do. Thanks, Dave. Great. Well, thank you, Nathan. Josh and I appreciate the opportunity to present to everyone today. Uh, this presentation was originally developed at the request of the National Steel Bridge Alliance. Uh, they asked us if we'd be willing to develop a presentation that walked through some of the thinking that contractors and construction engineers go through when developing bids, as, as well as walk through some of the minimum ASTO requirements as they pertain to the amount of information that should be included in a set of bid plans based on the different structure types. So, of course, we gladly said yes, uh, because we think it's important for owners and contractors, construction engineers, and design engineers to, to have a better understanding of the soup to nuts thinking behind the building of a bridge, you know, starting from the plan development stages through the bid process, all the way through construction. All right, we're just flipping through here. Give us just a second here. So welcome to our presentation. Uh, we know we have quite a mix of listeners ranging from design engineers to construction engineers to contractors as well as owners, both public and private. Uh, Josh and I have a lot of information to share and we hope we can present it in a manner that helps everyone gain a perspective of the thinking that goes on in the areas that they may not be familiar, familiar with or may, may not even be aware exists as part of the, the bridge design and building process. So a quick overview of our presentation. Uh, I'm Dave Rogowski, and I will get things rolling by discussing some of the thinking and planning and strategies behind a contractor's bid. Now I say some of the thinking and planning because we will be focusing on the erection of a superstructure, but we don't want to lose sight that there's the same level of thinking and planning behind the construction of the foundations and the substructure units. Josh uh, Crane will then come in and talk about the roles and the rules behind the information included in the bridge plans as required by AASHTO. After Josh walks through the plan development phase, I'll come back and I'll touch on some of the considerations that are taken to develop loads for temporary structures used in the erection of a bridge. Josh will pop back in and talk about bridge demolition which is a uh, very interesting subject, uh, but one without much code guidance. Would you believe me if I told you that there's about one permanent bridge structure in America that was designed with the eventual thought that someday it would, be, it would need to be completely demolished or deconstructed? Hmm. Makes for some interesting conversations around the old coffee table here at Genesis Structure, believe me. Isn't it ironic? that girders that support daily traffic, including some of the oversized trucks that deliver excavators to the job sites, are not very happy when we place that same excavator on those girders to take them apart. Well, Josh is going to take a few minutes and go over some of the challenges we face when we're deconstructing a bridge. And then finally, we're going to wrap up with some conclusions. 
And you should even have some time to take some questions, as Nate said, uh, you know, from the audience. And so hopefully we'll, we'll have some time to do that. Overall, our goal is to acknowledge that there needs to be a line of demarcation between owners and contractors and their respective engineers, but also hopefully demonstrate that with a little more interaction at the parties up front, say by softening that line just a little bit, every project has a potential for greater uh, and better success. Now before we start, uh, Josh and I want everyone to know that although this is a AISC, or that AISC is sponsoring this presentation, you are going to hear some conversations and discussions related to the ASCO constructability requirements of precast structures. Now we added this discussion because like all steel structures, precast concrete structures also require a lot of planning, regardless of how conventional or how simple the structure may seem. But of course, because of the different material types, some of that planning may be different, especially when discussing longer and more complex bands when the splices are introduced. ASCO does address a designer's responsibility for ensuring constructability of complex steel and concrete bridges differently. And because of this, Josh and I, along with AISC, felt it was important to review these differences and address some of the gray areas that are currently within the ASHTO uh, code requirements for steel bridges. And again, Josh will cover these similarities, similarities and differences in his part of the presentation. So let's get started. Uh, my part of the presentation, as I mentioned earlier, is focused on the behind the scenes thinking and planning that take place during the bid development stage. It's pretty simple when you think about it. In order to properly bid a bridge project, we have to figure out how it's going to get built. And questions are asked. Where do you start? Or which span or segment of the bridge gets erected first? Typically, a great starting point is at the fixed span, but is that always possible? Maybe not. What direction or directions does the erection need to proceed? Ideally, working from one end to the other may be preferred, but may not always be possible. What are the site constraints, or what are the design constraints as it relates to the permanent structure? With today's technology, we use Google Earth, site visits, and drone videos a lot to plan out these erection processes. Additional questions that get asked, where can the cranes be placed? The available crane pad locations may not actually match the ideal crane location. Contractors will evaluate what equipment they own versus what they may have to lease, or what is even available or not available locally or regionally. To start these evaluations, programs like 3D Lift are paired with AutoCAD and Google Earth to study boom angles, pick heights, and capacities. But what happens when the crane access is not possible or feasible? Well, then we've got to create that access. The example shown in this photo is a project where there was a large tide cycle and cranes on barges were considered. And when the tide was high, there was plenty of water. But when the tide was low, most of the site was too shallow to float, and some areas, some areas were even left with exposed rock. Jacket barges, which are barges that are literally lifting themselves up out of the water, were considered, but the size of the crane required for the steel erection and the inability to deliver girders to that crane limited those thoughts. And ultimately, the decision was made to launch rail beams and utilize an overhead gantry system. Sometimes the girder delivery access is actually built into the erection staging. This example shown in the photo uses the overhead gantry crane to erect the girders. However, instead of the gantry having to make trips all the way back to and from the abutment, the precast deck was factored into the erection staging and was used as access for the crane. So the overhead gantry would erect three spans of steel and precast, and then while the gantry was prepping to advance forward by launching, the deck panels were grouted and prepped to delivery truck access. The process re was repeated 10 times over the river valley. But what if the large equipment access simply is impossible? Or what if there are extreme environmental conditions to deal with? Well, that might actually dictate the construction method. The site for this project allowed smaller cranes to zigzag down the slopes with the use of switchbacks. But there was no reasonable way to provide access for girder delivery and or access to accommodate the size of cranes required to make the fix. Therefore, it was decided that this bridge would be uh, erected behind the abutments and then incrementally launched across the river valley. And most importantly, no matter what equipment is proposed to build a project, worker access and worker safety has to be number one priority. And the big question to ask is, 
How do we get workers to circulate all and access the critical and difficult areas? This project was one where the only way to access the piers and the high overhead superstructure was through the use of tall, 120-foot or taller man lifts. All these things need to be considered. So, okay, we've considered the access issues and we've studied them. But before the crane can be sized, there needs to be a good understanding of the size of pieces to pick. So whether steel or concrete, weight and center of gravity takeoffs are performed. The access studies will determine the pick radius and, the, and then when combined with the calculated weight, including rigging, the equipment can then be sized properly. Sometimes, sometimes things are simply very tight and boom clearance may become an issue. Study of these critical make or break picks is definitely imperative. And again, we use 3D lift software as a great program to use for some of these studies. Now, hard decisions have to be made. Forcing a standard crane into a project where it will be inefficient may feel better because the contractor owns the equipment, but in reality, the savings due to that ownership may quickly be chewed up due to those inefficiencies. And therefore, Sometimes the decision is just to invest in a different type of crane. Now, how high are the girders and what is the needed reach? Answers to this question is going to dictate the boom length, which then may actually dictate the crane size. Are there any special railroad owner requirements or, or, or factors of safety? Railroads and some DOTs require a factor of safety of up to 1.5 over the rated capacities of equipment. In this example, the new structure was erected over 130 feet in the air and over an existing railroad viaduct, which then limited where the crane could be placed and eventually dictated the maximum size of the pieces that could be erected. Are we working on water? Crane XYZ, as shown, has a certain rated capacity on land, but does not have the same capacity when floating on a barge, and especially the capacity gets even worse if the barge is not properly sized. And if site access is already really tight, say in an urban environment, life gets really interesting when it takes a second smaller assist crane to assemble the main production crane. And as I mentioned earlier, safety is number one. And I think everyone listening in on the webinar would agree. Bad days in the construction industry must and I mean must be limited to challenges with material deliveries and weather, not accidents and certainly not in, uh, injuries. Now, with the first round of equipment placing and sizing and all those kind of things, you know, in the, in the process, more questions pop up. How do we feed the beast and get the girders to the crane? Well, option one would be bring it right to the crane, but that may not always be possible. Is there an access road? Is there an access road where there is enough room to bring the truck up to the side of the crane? Or is there room to pick from behind and then swing the girder? Does the project possibly have access such that girders could be brought in by rail? Well, most railroads will cooperate if the work is for their property or on a siding, but most likely won't allow downtime to bring girders to a crane if access, for instance, was adjacent to a mainline traffic. Option two, get the girders close, have the crane go get it, and then walk the girder to where it needs to go. But that has challenges. If the crane has to walk to the load and walk with the load, that limits the contractor to crawler cranes and eliminates the use of more portable hydraulic cranes. This would be critically special, especially critical if the project required maybe just one pick and the large crane was only needed for one day. Mobilization and setup times for a large crawler crane is quite different than from uh, the more mobile hydraulic cranes. How do we get the girder to the site? Are they truckable? Different girder lengths and weights will dictate the on-road delivery system. Steerable dollies are typically great tools to have with the delivery long girders, especially when transporting through local streets with tight corners and potential interferences. All these things need to be studied in advance. Sometimes the site constraints or time constraints to shut down or detour traffic are very tight. So the bridge will need to be erected away from the actual project site and then delivered on heavy self-propelled transporters. 
Sometimes a new bridge has to be built under existing ones, and crane access is impossible. So the bridge is built to the side and then moved in right under the existing structure. Sometimes the bridge has to be built on land, rolled onto a barge so it can be delivered as a whole unit using waterways. Sometimes the bridge has to be built on land, rolled onto a barge, then raised 60 to 70 feet so it can be delivered as a whole unit using waterways. And sometimes it may take two cranes and a series of maneuvers to deliver a girder. Here's an example where a girder was brought to the side on its side, one crane picked half the girder, a portion of the bogey system was removed, the truck backed up a little more, then allowed a second crane to pick up the other girder. The girder was then laid on a barge, tripped from vertical from horizontal to vertical, and then paired with another girder on the barge, and then finally erected. And so what if the girder is so tall that it does actually require to be delivered on a side and then tripped on the side? This process is doable, but requires special rigging considerations, so this would be another important issue to know as part of the bid planning. And speaking of rigging, more questions need to be asked and answered. What is the best way to rig a girder for a project? Does a girder pick require special rigging to keep it stable? A very long girder may not like being picked at a single point over the center of gravity and could require a series of trees of rigging to distribute the pick points properly. Girders may have to be picked in pairs to solve stability issues. That's great, but now we just doubled the pick size along with probably an, in, an in, increase in the crane size. Okay, so now we rigged the girder and lifted the girder, but we can't just stop there. Once in place, does that girder want to stay there all by itself? Most of the time, precast or steel, the first and sometimes even the second, or maybe, depending on the span length, maybe the third girder erected requires special attention for lateral bracing. For this single eye girder, a special frame called the stability truss was added to strengthen the buckling capacity of the top flange. Believe it or not, the exposed bridge with no deck on it yet could potentially be in one of the most precarious moments of its, of its existence. And temporary bracing may be required to control odd thermal and wind deflections just to control geometry to pour the deck. More robust and rigid girders may not need top flange bracing, but most likely we need some form of temporary bracing at the end. And bridge erection is all about assembling parts and pieces. Girders may be designed to span from pier to pier, simply or in a continuous fashion, but we have to deal with these things called splices. No matter the structure type, steel or precast, there is a splice, and there is odd geometry and long spans, there's going to be false work towers. Now they can be pre-manufactured as shown in this photo. They can be designed and detailed special for a project with the hope that portions of the towers could be matched to existing equipment and potentially have reuse, or they can be very unique and designed for one project with most, the most likely ending being scrapped at the end of the day. The yellow highlight is a temporary works, for example, to required to support the girder frames above, and there's a twin to balance it on the other side, and there were two sets that had to be built so they could be hopscotch from pier to pier as the spans were erected. So who is the one person that every contractor and engineer knows about? And who is the one person every contractor and construction engineer evaluates daily risk? Mother Nature. And I can confidently tell you, tell all our listeners, Mother Nature will win every time if we don't pay her respect and design for her. Now there's nothing unsafe with these erected girders shown. However, they are restrained at each end with fixed bearings. So temperature changes can impact the shape of the girders. In this case, temporary freedom was required with one set of the bearings to release some of the stress in the system. We have even seen crazy warping in north-south girders occur as the sun rises from east to west. These are all things that need to be considered during the erection process of a bridge. And there is nothing unsafe with these girders shown, but they were deep enough and oriented just perfectly for the winds in the area to have an impact on the stage awaiting the deck placement. Now, unfortunately, we had a cool video here, but it's not working today. It's kind of slow and lagging, so we opted not to show it. But if it was working, you'd see the girders oscillating one foot to two foot back and forth, side to side, due to sustained winds. 
And sometimes additional lateral bracing may be required just to help control some of these concerns for deck placement. Now even more questions. How long is the overhang cantilever? Can this dictate the bracket type and size? Are there special conditions that may require specially designed brackets? Is the girder tall enough to even to receive a conventional overhead bracket? Is the girder stable under overhang loading? And for what the screed load would be? Now Josh will discuss this later in the presentation, but some DOTs require that those assumptions be made by the designer and noted in the plans as to what girders have been checked and what they've been checked for regarding travelers and overhang truck forming. Now, we've been talking about erecting the new bridge, but how many projects have existing bridges to deal with? What if that existing bridge needs to come down in stages or even whole after the new bridge is complete? Where does that bridge demolition start? What direction does the, does the demolition need to proceed? What equipment do we need to remove the bridge? If these questions sound familiar, well, they should because they're the same questions we ask when trying to figure out how to erect the bridge. And finally, how do we get rid of the debris? And as I mentioned earlier, Josh is going to talk a little more in depth on bridge dem demolition later in the presentation. So as you can see, there's a lot of thinking and planning and strategizing behind a contractor's bid. A solid plan of attack is needed because it is from that solid plan that a base bid price is going to be developed. Now equipment costs are not small numbers, so it is critical to understand the type and size needed, as well as how long it's going to be needed on the project. Everything has a price, and every tweak to the need can impact that price. How fast is the delivery schedule? What fabricators can even handle the type, size, and schedule of the material order? How long after the bids are submitted will the contract be awarded? The longer suppliers are asked to hold prices, the more it can impact the cost. Where is the project? How many and what types of crew will be needed to complete a task? What are the typical production rates for a given task? How are those production rates affected from, by the time of the year when they're performed? And by no means, I don't think this is a knock on anyone, but extreme cold or extreme heat or lots of long shifts definitely impact the ability and efficiency of the labor force. And then finally, depending on the project location, the labor force may need to be obtained through a local union or could be more of an open shop environment. As we discussed, temporary structures may be, may be needed. Depending on the size and type, they may be large and may be require special foundations. We discussed that some girders may need temporary lateral bracing. The magnitude of all these costs have to be captured, fabrication and or lease, installation and then removal. It all adds up. We talked about equipment access to the site. You may have to build that access or prepare the site to support the weight of the equipment, including the roadway grading and or addition of crane mats. If you need to work on water or require access to the water, the cost of lease, build, upgrade barges, trestles, and bulkheads must be identified. And what is the fin finished product of the final product? With, the steel, with steel, there are a number of finished options, and they could depend on the project location and or the DOT's preference. And with the push-on aesthetics, we are even seeing colored precast or even painted precast. All these finished options have costs, and the finished selection has an impact on cost as it relates to how the prices and the pieces are prepped in the shop, transported to the site, and finally handled in the field. And this slide goes without saying anything. Time is money. Okay, so far we've looked at the planning and the thinking behind the bid and also shown how the planning impacts the cost with the bid. So the last thing I'd like to talk about is the types of contract bid process processes and how they may affect the competition of a bid. The first bid process is known as the, is probably the most common, design build, the designer builds, I mean, a, excuse me, designer designs, a contractor bids, and a contractor builds. The design bid build process. Now that isolates the contractors from the owners and their engineers as the design is complete and presented to the contractors for bidding. Everyone is bidding the same final product so the challenge is to figure out how to build the most efficiently, both cost and schedule. The second bid process, design build, is an option that we honestly have seen drastic ranges of success stories from, good to bad. Price, schedule, and the best idea typically wins. The end product is typically a very fine structure, but depending on the success story, relationships between contractors and owners or contractors and designers could be strengthened or strained. In this process, the designers are the subcontractors 
to the contractors. And admittedly, this is a tough spot for designers to be in, as they are trying to serve two masters. For a given project, they are working for a contractor and want to do a great job for them, but their bread and butter client is most likely the owner. So what we find typically on projects where the success story was not great is communication. Communication was not great between the contractor and the engineer. Admittedly, their, need, their, their needs are different, and many times that is the problem was that there's not a go-between go engineer that is bilingual and understands the hot buttons of the contracting community as well as the possible design restrictions or codes of, of the design community. The last bid process I want to mention is the construction manager general contractor, the CMGC process. We have really enjoyed the CMGC process. Everyone works for the owner and everyone including the owner is involved in the process as challenges are discovered and solved and project costs are established. Now, where the CMGC process fails sometimes is when there is no apparent room for concessions to constraints, for instance environmental restrictions and or schedule and survey and or temporary traffic patterns. If all creative measures to work around or through the constraints are rejected, then the CMGC process does not work to the level it could, and projects would still be over budget. But this is still better than having the project go out for bid and come in 25 to 50 percent or worse over the engineer's estimate, which would then be a complete surprise to the owner. Using the CMGC process, if the project cost escalates due to constraints, the owner is aware of those cost growth and is part of the decision-making process behind those costs. So now I'm going to turn it over to Josh and let him talk about the uh, designer's aspect of what goes into plans. All right, thanks, Dave. Josh, are, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry. Um, okay, we, lo so we, lost, we lost you from the beginning there, Josh. So if okay. you said anything, just start, start back. Yep. All right. Well, I'll – all right. So um, Dave talked a lot about the uh, considerations and the uh, decision-making that must go on to figure out how you're going to build a bridge structure. And that ranged from anything from something more conventional to something uh, that was more complicated. Now, most of his examples and discussion items focus on what um, a contractor or a construction engineer with knowledge of that contractor's preference would consider when evaluating a bridge project. But in reality, as we all know, there are many important players who have worked on a bridge project typically before a contractor has ever uh, laid his eyes on the, on, the, on the contract plans. Now, obviously everyone's ultimate goal is to ensure a bridge does not have um, unforeseen issues during construction or that those unforeseen issues are limited. And it takes good efforts from all parties to ensure that this happens. But because there are so many groups involved, sometimes the lines can get blurred on who is responsible for what. And so in this section here, I'm going to take a quick dive into the AASHTO specifications to study the expectations for each group's responsibility to ensure that a bridge is constructible. So Dave, Dave went through a, a typical design bid build um, um, in, in his section, but we're going to quickly walk through um, a typical design bid build process and discuss the roles of each of the major players. So everything starts with the owner DOT. They're the ones who establish the project need, uh, come up with, with funding, and they have certain expectations for all bridge projects. They typically have uh, standard details. They have their own bridge design manuals that allow for them to get the type of product that um, they are comfortable with. And one issue that's always important uh, for any DOT or owner is to limit the unforeseen issues during a bridge's construction. A designer, whether that be the DOT uh, or, a, or an outside consultant, regardless of the design selected, uses their expertise and experience in design to ensure that the product produced is constructible. No design engineer that I've ever met wants to design a bridge that has issues in construction, unless they hate contractors or like getting sued. Uh, now, they have the most intimate knowledge of the bridge's behavior and response to loads in their final condition. 
but a design engineer maybe necessarily hasn't always worked through a, a, a complete erection sequence, studying the bridge's capacity and stability throughout construction. And that's certainly not, not necessary for all, for all cases. And then it's the contractor's turn to get into the mix. And contractors bring in their own unique perspective, expertise, and experience to figure out the means and methods for how to build these bridges that the engineer of records had designed. All of the great information that Dave provided in his section. Now, a contractor may have performed some, some staged analysis to uh, verify that the uh, selected method of erection that they're, that they're thinking is the best option um, prior to establishing their, their, their final bid. Or they may be relying on past experience with other similar types of structures for different parts of the bid. Now, ultimately, the question that I'm looking to answer uh, in my section is when the contract plans are handed over from the engineer of record to the, to the contractor, uh, what is the responsibility of, 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 of those two parties, the engineer of record and the contractor, to determine the potential issues um, in construction when establishing costs? So um, in, in, in a little bit better fashion, the questions I'm looking to answer, number one, is when is a bridge complex enough so engineering is required um, to ensure the constructability or stability during erection? In other words, what kind of a threshold is there between a more conventional and a more complex system where construction engineering would or wouldn't be required? Um, another question that I look to dive into is when should a, a, a DOT or the owner who has um, the most intimate knowledge of, the, of how the bridge was designed, when should they uh, be responsible for making contractors aware of limitations during construction? This could be something as simple as what Dave had mentioned with his overhang bracket um, uh, example, where if the girder is too, is too shallow to uh, handle a typical overhang bracket, is that something that um, should be made available in, in the plans? And, what, and where do you draw the line there? And then, and then we're going to get into um, when is the suggested erection sequence required and when is it not? Uh, what, again, what is the threshold by which uh, a bridge is complicated enough so a suggested erection sequence would be a good idea? And ultimately, we're going to um, answer all of these by uh, looking into the ASHTO specifications. So we're going to be looking at uh, two main ASHTO specs, the bridge design specifications and the construction specifications to seek out these answers to these, to these questions. We're going to start with the bridge design specifications and really focus on three chapters um, and, three, and sections within these three chapters. The first being chapter number two. It's the first place in which constructability shows up in the bridge design specifications. And then we're going to go into the concrete and steel chapters and really hone in on what types of uh, um, rules and regulations they put in to try to make sure that a bridge design is uh, constructible from, from the get-go. So diving right into it, chapter number two. The very first time that um, constructability shows up within AASHTO is in section 2.5.3 where um, this, this statement is made that a bridge should be designed so that um, erection can be performed um, without a, a, a lot of headache and then that the locked-in construction force effects are within tolerable limits. Now anyone who has worked on a bridge erection before knows that there are going to be locked-in construction forces. That's just part of the deal. That's going to happen when you build any, any type of bridge. But those have to be evaluated in some circumstances to make sure you're, that you're not exceeding the bridge's capacity. Now this section goes on to say um, that if the bridge is of unusual complexity, at least one feasible construction method shall be indicated in the contract documents. And this is a great statement because it gets the designer thinking that maybe they should prove that the bridge can be built in some circumstances. But the one uh, drawback to this, and again, one of the questions we're looking to answer is, when is the bridge of unusual complexity and when is it conventional? conventional? Uh, in this case, um, there's really no um, delineation between the two. So sometimes that is on a case-by-case -case basis. Now again, we're going to um, start with concrete, work our way into steel, and we're going to talk about constructability considerations for different, different structure types, starting with the most simple and working into the most complex. And we're going to be focusing on girder type bridges. So the most simple type of concrete bridge structure out there is a precast concrete beam. And the AASHTO specifications say that pre-service conditions shall be the responsibility of the contractor. 
So these um, beams are good for you know, shorter span lengths, less than 200 feet, but in, in these instances, all of the erection and handling of the girder is the responsibility of the contractor. So we'll go ahead and we'll label that one as more conventional. Now stepping up a level in complexity, um, splice precast girder bridges, if curvature is desired or if span ranges are um, needing to get a little bit longer, uh, these animals can be considered. Now they are, um, a, a huge step up in, in complexity to erect. And Ashto um, identifies that in the sense that it says, uh, the method of construction assumed for the design shall be shown in the contract documents. And this makes sense because this type of bridge cannot be erected um, at many, uh, without, without false work. And part of the design has to include what kind of locked in construction forces that there are gonna be. So we'll go ahead and label that type of bridge as complex. So again, working through, um, mo moving up in complexity, we go to segmental concrete bridges where if even longer spans are desired. Ashto basically has a rinse and repeat of the statement that it made for splice precast girders, at least, uh, the, that, and it says that the method of construction shall be shown in the contract documents. So certainly, if a splice precast girder bridge is complicated, so is segmental. Uh, for anyone who's worked on segmental bridges, they know that um, they even come with their own set of special construction load combinations to ensure that, um, that, that the bridge itself is, uh, is going to be okay for um, the stresses induced during construction. All right, so now switching over to steel girder bridges, uh, why we're all here today, and focusing mainly on steel eye girder bridges because uh, this is the most um, common type of a, of, a, of a steel bridge, at least that we work on at Genesis. So the steel eye girder bridge section within Ashto is, is located in section 610. And there are six main components that uh, a designer must consider in order to design a steel girder bridge. And the one that we're gonna focus on is 610.3 and how it relates to the constructability and the considerations that need to be made. Now the first, um, so jumping right, right ahead to that 610.3, uh, the first statement that um, Ashto makes is it points you back to Article 253, which basically puts it on the designer to uh, know that they can't design a bridge that's difficult or uh, to erect, and they have to decide whether the bridge uh, needs a suggested erection sequence based off of uh, relative complexity. So it's also to um, say that the designer should be responsible for checking the bridge or satisfying the requirements of 610.3.2 and 610.3.3 for each critical stage of construction. So if you jump ahead to that section, I don't expect you to memorize this, it's not going to be a test, but um, what um, Ashto does say for the designer to consider is that for each critical stages of construction, the following requirements shall be met. And these equations are uh, for capacities for given stress values that could occur during stages of construction, before the deck is poured, when the girders are braced between the cross frames and not braced by the deck. But the one question that would come up in my mind if I was a designer looking at this requirement is what are the critical stages of construction? Well, there's really only a couple that are identified within Ashto. Um, and one of the main ones being when the deck is poured. Uh, for a steel eye girder bridge, uh, when the deck is poured, there are going to be um, uh, in inherent amounts of stress that are, that, that are locked in that are in induced on that, on that bridge in its uh, non-composite uh, resisting state. And so it, it's on the designer to not only uh, check but provide a deck pouring sequence on a set of plants. And following the deck pouring sequence is important because that is what the designer checked in terms of what kind of locked in stresses there are going to be. Now the other uh, critical stage, which has also to do with pouring the deck, is at the bottom what I, that I've highlighted here, is what David mentioned before, um, the effects of um, torsional loads from overhang brackets. Uh, this is just like pouring the deck. This is going to be a part of the construction of any conventional or complex eye girder bridge. So Identifying that and designing that fascia girder for those out of plane effects should be inherent in the design of that bridge. And that information um, for, you know, and good practice would be to let the contractor know what type of forces they're, they're capable of resisting. Um, 
Now, one new uh, section to ASHTO or one new equation within ASHTO 8th edition is this global buckling uh, equation. This is intended um, for um, evaluating the bridge while the deck is being poured. Um, it's, it's, it's similar to those equations that we showed before, but instead of individual girder buckling, this is studying system buckling. You can see from the image uh, at, the top of, at the top right of the screen, uh, that's what the buckle shape would look like for girders buckling individually between cross frames. The diagram just below is what the two girder system would look like buckling as a pair. Uh, this is going to be um, a concern for uh, narrow bridge systems uh, with maybe two, two or three girders. Um, and certainly is not anything new for us here at Genesis, or really shouldn't be anything new for any uh, construction engineer who's done erection engineering in the past. So I'll use that to kind of segue to a detour here, and I'm going to discuss some uh, useful resources uh, that can be used for erection analysis and could be utilized by a design engineer to have a better understanding of some of the critical stages of construction. Um, one of those documents is the FHWA manual, which is uh, Engineering for Structural Stability and Bridge Construction. And this, this document really has, is, is a wealth of information. It has a lot more information in it than maybe you'd even uh, take away from just the title itself. It's a, it's, it really is a nice document, and um, I would encourage um, any of those to, to get a copy and uh, utilize its uh, wealth of knowledge. Um, the other two, two, two documents that are um, available that we use here internally are the NSBA AASHTO uh, steel bridge erection specifications and then the NCHRP report, um, which, which are both helpful for um, analyzing a, bridge, a steel bridge structure during erection and um, what kind of requirements there are. Um, and then it also has sample erection sequences if anyone's interested. So the reason that uh, I use that uh, system buckling equation as a, as a segue is because that exact same equation that showed up in the old ASHTO has showed up in erection guidelines for, for a while now. And this type of equation wasn't necessarily used when the deck is poured because that would inherently be assumed to have been checked by the designer, but it's used for, for, for various stages of construction. This is a screenshot of a fine element model that we would have produced here at, here at Genesis, a temporary uh, stage of construction where maybe two girders are, are projected out ahead, and we need to evaluate whether that uh, is going to have fuel system uh, buckling problems or system buckling problems. These, these, these equations can be used as a um, shortcut to that. Um, typically, the type of analysis software we use is uh, Lucis for this type of analysis. Uh, this, this equation also, as you can see, uh, just different variables shows, shows up in the FHWA manual. And again, it's just um, it's, it's, it's the same consideration. It's just, it's just a slightly different uh, variable, there. Um, we talked about what the critical stages of construction are um, in terms of ASHTO. Most of them point towards um, when the deck is being poured. But one thing I really like about this uh, FHWA manual is it has a pretty nice and efficient list of typical critical stages for any bridge during construction. And we'll go through that list briefly here, but I would say that the top three on the list would be items that would typically be on the contractor or their construction engineer uh, to evaluate. And that would be first lifting the girder members themselves. So if, um, you know, not only evaluating those girders for stability, but all the checks associated with that. Um, if you're picking the girders as pairs, you may have built yourself additional stability, but because you've added weight, Maybe you have a, created a situation where you need to check your top flanges for local prying, depending on the type of rigging that is selected. The next critical stage would be uh, when that first girder gets, gets placed. Maybe there's stability issues. Maybe you need a helper crane to help relieve uh, some of the demand on that individual girder, or maybe you need temporary bracing to brace it down at the piers. The second, uh, or sorry, the third critical stage, and this, this, these two stages will bounce back and forth um, as you continue your erection, would be when the first pair of girders are set um, without uh, permanent bracing installed. So that would be, you know, the two girder system buckling checks that we talked about previous. So at the bottom of the list are two items that we already touched on that ASHTO dictates the designer should consider, and that being making sure the girder system is stable for the deck placement and making sure that that fascia girder can handle the torsional loads. And the one that area that we feel is a little bit gray is the item right in the middle there, 
which is uh, evaluating the girder system for, um, for uh, resistance to wind loads prior to the deck being poured. Um, to us, it seems like this should in inherently be considered by the designer because if the contractor builds out the, the structure, installs all the cross frames, there really shouldn't be an, an, an assumption that the structure can't handle loads for any extended period of time. So if a designer did want to consider this, where would they go to evaluate the wind on a structure prior to the deck being poured? So currently, AASHTO design specifications do not include um, wind on a, the completed structure prior to, prior to pouring the deck. There are reduced load factors within AASHTO um, that can be used for, for wind load during construction, but it's not really indica any indication of um, how much wind goes on a partially erected structure. There is, however, a guide spec for wind loads on bridges during construction that AASHTO also um, has, has, has produced. It's just not in the bridge design specification. So this is a, a good place where we would suggest going to get that type of uh, analysis accomplished. And this, uh, this, this, this document has a bunch of good information on um, developing the wind loads um, on, on different bridge types. And we're going to talk briefly now about some of the differences between the bridge design specs and this extra uh, wind load design specification. So again, um, the bridge design specs are designed to evaluate the wind on a bridge after it's, after it's constructed. So the deck is poured. The considerations really are, are only made to the depth of the uh, bridge and then, its, and then its length and a certain amount of pressure associated with that. However, when you take the deck off, wind um, is going to be uh, foremost on the windward face, that girder all the way to the left, but then the adjacent girders will also feel some of that wind load because the deck isn't there to shield it. Now, the amount of wind on those adjacent girders will vary depending on the depth of the girder or on, or, or on the spacing, and that's some of the information that's provided in this guide, um, in this, um, guide specification. So the equations also look very similar. Um, the variables are, um, are, are reused from one code to the other, to the other with a couple exceptions um, for, you know, these variables I've highlighted first are variables for wind speed, um, you know, uh, exposure coefficients based on how high the bridge is, things like that. But one of the variables that, that, that shows up in the uh, guide specs for wind during construction is this R value, which can be used by the engineer to evaluate some reduced amount of wind pressure based off of construction duration. So if, um, if, if there's a known construction period of time where the amount of risk associated with a permanent design wind is less, you can take advantage of those reductions. And we, and we do that at Genesis quite, quite regularly. Uh, the next factor is this uh, drag coefficient factor, which, which has to do with the type of structure and essentially um, how, much, how much you have to amplify that based off the shape of the structure. So as a quick uh, quantitative example as to why this is important, um, is, is, is going to be reflected in the next few images shown here. The first being the amount of wind load that would occur on a four girder, a five girder, and a six girder bridge system stacked from top to bottom. Regardless of the number of girders that um, are present in this type of system, the total design wind is going to be the same. It's, it's not um, dependent on the number of girders that you have. If you take the deck off, same girder depth, same spacing, um, this is just one example, um, even if you are considering wind with the um, smallest R value or the shortest construction period, you can see that a four girder system isn't, and a five girder system aren't as much wind as the final design load, but as soon as you move to that six girder, you've already bumped up the total amount of total wind on the system. And keep in mind that um, the, the bridge before the deck is poured is at its most vulnerable state. It's most flexible and its least ability to resist load. And then if you bump it up to the next um, construction duration, six weeks to a year, uh, you can see even with the four girder system, you've exceeded that permanent design load. Now, there are some states that have um, taken some action here with regards to longer spans, uh, steel bridges, which have, which have issues, um, which can sometimes have um, uh, issues before the deck is being poured. Uh, before the deck is poured. Uh, PennDOT is, is an example of that. 
they have their own uh, re requirements for the amount of wind that can be calculated on these bridge girder systems, very, very similar to um, the AASHTO guides that I just showed. But they have a couple of rules of thumb that are, um, can be useful for a designer to consider, and that is whether or not you need lateral bracing to increase the stiffness and the capacity of the bridge system before the deck is poured. So the first rule is if the spans are in excess of 300 feet, lateral bracing shall be added to aid in the construction of the bridge. The next rule is for um, another range of span lengths from 200 to 300 feet, that item number two there, and that's up to the designer to consider based on uh, lateral deflection. Now, the lateral deflection criteria that PennDOT specifies is L over 150. This is not an AASHTO criteria, um, not within AASHTO itself, but it's a, uh, it's a baseline or, or a threshold by which to determine whether um, lateral bracing should be provided for spans greater than 200 feet um, for a bridge system. So again, moving ahead here, I'm done with my detour, I'm going to now touch briefly and, and move codes from the bridge design specifications to the bridge construct, con construction specifications. And the reason I included this is it does provide a little bit more insight with uh, constructability requirements and division of responsibilities for steel bridge girders. Um, it, it, does have, um, it does have other additional specifications for, for concrete bridges, but really nothing that much different than the bridge design specs. So we're going to kind of uh, skip that. It does, however, have some more information for different requirements and expectations for considerations for constructability uh, for uh, steel girders. And so we're going to jump into that. Again, we're in the bridge design uh, specs here. Uh, this, uh, this code for, um, does have a good uh, recognition and definition of what should be provided in erection drawings. Uh, it says that contractors shall submit uh, erection drawings uh, really regardless of the complexity of the structure uh, that, that documents their method of erection. It does say that calculations may be required. So this is just a general section that, that, that can be, um, that can be um, used for conventional or more complex bridges. So we'll go ahead and say that's a conventional or a complex uh, requirement. The one place where the construction specs do identify and start div di um, dividing some line between more conventional and complex is for curved girder bridges. Um, it does, just like for the erection plan, it says that uh, construction plans shall be provided by the contractor. It may be their own erection sequence or it may be one that's uh, designated on the plans, but it does indicate that a contractor's construction plans shall be stamped by a PE. So I think this is an indication that um, curve girders, as uh, anyone who's worked on them before would uh, realize, is that this is, this is more of a complex bridge system and there needs to be more analysis associated with the construction of these systems. So in summary, um, I've tried to go through the AASHTO codes and divide out um, where a uh, structure would be considered conventional and where it would be considered complex for steel and both for concrete bridges. Um, you can see the definitions there um, in the uh, table um, to, the, to the far right. But in terms of what AASHTO uh, designates for conventional bridges, precast beams, shorter steel spans, there's really no uh, suggested erection plan and very little in construction engineering that should be the responsibility of the engineer of record. For uh, concrete uh, complex systems, actually it's pretty, pretty clear that suggested erection plans or the erection plans assumed in design need to be considered. And with steel, I would say this is sometimes. It's not, it's not really um, black and white. It's more of a gray area. It's more on a project to project basis or again sometimes it just leaves it to the DOTs and their individual British design manuals to determine what type of um, engineering for construction is required from the engineer of record. Now, in terms of what the contractor is responsible for, um, it's, it's pretty clear to me that for any type of bridge, erection plans are required. Now, whether there's engineering required to support that information, I would say for conventional, that would be up to the DOT. Um, but I would say it's, it's pretty clear from the contractor's perspective that engineering is, is required for these complex bridge systems. Now, um, just to kind of summarize um, here, I really think that concrete um, does, does do um, 
uh, or has, has a little bit more clear delineation between uh, conventional and complex. And that, a lot of that is out of necessity. The bridge is going to be very difficult to design without knowing how it's going to be built. Um, sorry, the uh, steel bridges may be not as uh, clear within ASTRO themselves. And so some DOTs have made an effort to address this. Um, KDOT, uh, I'm here, does actually have a clause to or clause to categorize steel bridges in all different categories of direction. So you see the chart there on the right. Uh, the x-axis is the curvature of the bridge, or radius in feet, and the y-axis is the span length. And you can see the tighter the radius, the smaller that number, and the longer the span length, you start getting into the category C range, which is the most complex um, and, 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 and most, it, it, it's recognized as needing the most uh, erection engineering analysis. And then once you get to straighter, shorter span bridges, you fall into category A, and not as much uh, engineering, and it's not as strict on what is required. Now, there, there is consideration made to skew, um, where if you're at a skew of 30 degrees or more, you, you, up, you, you raise up a category. And to this point, I've only talked about um, the geometry of the bridge, but also if it's over traffic or near a railroad, you're, you're automatically in, in category B. So there is, um, there is some good information here and some merit to being able to formally categorize a bridge into different erection categories. A designer fills out this chart is the uh, um, and uh, the category, and then a contractor can can bid it that way, and that way everyone's on the same playing field during time when the cost is established. Now we've been talking we talked just about the K dot um, uh, specifications here. One thing that I want to point out, if anyone's curious, uh, is this another bit of good information in this uh, FHWA manual? Is it actually does have a provide a survey of uh, different DOTs and has a a list of questions on their past experience related to girder erection, and it asks the questions pretty much point blank. What is the threshold by which uh, you require a submittal um, for, uh, with engineering support for erection plans? How do you require that to be reviewed? So there's some good information uh, here, again, with a, a bunch of different DOTs. Um, I thought it would not be a good idea to not mention a, a, a very good um, and uh, useful um, guideline that uh, AASHTO and NSBA puts out re regarding constructability of uh, steel, steel girder bridges. Now this uh, document uh, is, is related to ensuring that a bridge is easy to fabricate and has uh, good, um, good connection designs, but it doesn't necessarily cover um, erection analysis. So, if I haven't scared anyone away from wanting to become construction engineers and joining Dave and I in this, uh, in this venture, I thought I'd do a quick uh, engineer's literature review or construction engineer's literature review to wrap things up. So you have to be up to date with your standard design specifications, the latest ASHTO and even the older ones because we do get into older bridge design and, and, and ratings. Uh, you have to know all the different erection guides and specifications that are out there, at least an understanding of when uh, a document like this could, uh, could help you in your analysis. Um, and then you have to be able to develop your construction, um, your construction loads. Dave's going to uh, touch on this in his next section, but you've got to know where to go to, to find those so you're not designing your uh, temporary works for a permanent bridge load. If you want to design your temporary works, you've got to know what code to use for that. Um, AASHTO has some good guidelines. Um, these are some other manuals that we use internally to design our temporary works. Uh, if you're getting into rigging, you've got to know the ASME codes um, and, um, for, for design of below the hook. And then one thing I'm going to touch on later is where do you go to evaluate a bridge for, for demolition. There are some documents out there that have uh, given this a start, but um, sometimes you do more head scratching when you're looking for standardization when how to analyze a bridge during demo currently. So if anyone feels like uh, doing this right now after looking after all those codes, that's, that's understandable. But again, the, the whole idea and the benefit of all of this information is, uh, you know, building on what others have um, experienced and the uh, knowledge from, from the past. So with that, I'm going to turn things back over to Dave, and he's going to get into design loads for temporary structures. Thank you, Mr. Josh. All right, so I would say that from what we've shown uh, today, you can probably bet that almost every bridge structure requires some form of temporary works, whether it's towers, temporary bracing, 
uh, crane requirements, things like that. And all of these temporary works are going to require some form of design and planning to accommodate those construction loads. Now, the trick is, even though Josh showed a few manuals that gave us ideas of, you know, some of the environmental things to consider in construction loads, maybe some of the, the, the imbalance loads on dead loads, uh, the equipment loads are not necessarily as easily defined and or the limits to what we need to take them to. And I think it's really important for everyone to understand that, that you know, it's a risk reward process for the contracting community and as construction engineers, it's similar to design engineers with their owners, you know, you need to educate your owners on the design process of the permanent bridge. Well, the construction engineers really need to make sure we educate our contractor clients on all of the pros and cons of a minimum design level risk or design level and compare that to the risk that, that would be taken. Uh, as I indicated earlier, time is money and, 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 and the amount of false work that is required is money and that's all part of the bid process. So, yeah, I like to look. I like this little quote there where it says, "Calculated risks are risks with a plan," and that's basically the bid process uh, that that contractors and construction engineers go with. We're we're building a calculated risk with the assembly of this bridge, and that risk has a plan. Now, uh, equipment loads. You know, you would think manufacturers provide you all the right data, right? Well. Yes, when you're talking about some of these specialty lift equipments, uh, the, the hydraulic lifts and the, and the transporters, those companies are very good to work with. Uh, they provide us capacities and reactions, stability criteria, very good, good people. The crane people, very good people. They have programs out there where we can calculate the uh, outrigger reactions. We can even calculate the track pressures based on swings, pick lengths, pick, pick uh, uh, weights. Uh, almost to the point where, you know, we have convinced uh, departments of transportation that uh, we know the, the, the load on a structure better than they do based on some of their live load requirements uh, that ASTO provides. But track equipment, excavators and drill rigs, these folks are not fun to work with and we've even found in the industry that when our clients own equipment, uh, these folks are, are not willing to hand out track pressures and things like that and it's primarily because of the variety of things that can be done with this equipment uh, based on an operator's comfort level uh, and, and things that can be done with, within the capacity of the machine. So sometimes we have to calculate our own track pressures and, and we do this by, you know, figuring out what is the attachment or the pick weight on the machine. You know, where is the center of gravity? And sometimes we have to break the machine down uh, piece by piece. We can get all that information from the manufacturers sometimes. Uh, and we have to back calculate our own center of gravity. And then we need to know what the machine capacities are because there are certain restrictions on what the, on, on what the machine can do. And by doing this, we calculate an effective track pressure for that excavator. Now, is that track pressure uniformly loaded or, or some type of trapezoidal loading? Or is it more of a point load? Well, what it comes down to is the length of the structure you're on. On a shorter span, you're probably going to have more influence as a uniform load. Uh, and this is primarily because the shorter spans are stiffer, and so, so is a track, uh, the track girder on, 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 on a crane or an excavator. But the longer the span, the more flexible the span, and actually that, that track reaction turns into, you know, basically two point loads of some sort, focus more on the end tumblers. Now here's the one that's, that's very interesting, and that's the impact. And there are a variety of conversations that are out there in the industry related to impact. And you can see that there's a variety of options that folks can take depending on the code. So these are some codes that uh, Josh had mentioned earlier, and you can see the range of impact that is considered between excavators and cranes. Um, and some of them even just have the old little asterisk or per manufacturer's requirements, which then you go back to the manufacturer, they really don't get specific on. So what does it come down to? Well, you've got the ideal situation, you've got the actual situation, and then you've got the operations. And it comes down to a conversation and a comfort level between us, the construction engineers, 
and our contractor clients. Now, when we get into the environmental loads on false work, uh, you know, we know from a permanent bridge standpoint that Mother Nature does affect the permanent bridges, but she does have something to say about temporary structures. So you have wind, temperature, seismic, stream flow, ice, debris, scour that needs to be considered for the temporary works also. And sometimes things don't go as planned. Uh, you know, water does happen in flood times. Uh, we try to plan for high water situations, but you know, sometimes there are flood conditions that do occur. And these need to be considered, and that's part of that risk reward process that we discussed earlier. Um, all temporary works do require designing and planning to accommodate those environmental loads, but sometimes you don't accommodate all of them, and you can see that things can happen in the field. Now this would be an example where, you know, this was a river that did get a lot of buildup and was anticipated, and the, the trestle that you see there was designed to handle some of that. That was one of those duration risk assessments that, you know, was decided in the bid process uh, as the project was being uh, looked at. And again, this one was in a sad situation where uh, there was an ice flow, and that was something that was not anticipated. And that ice flow actually took the barges uh, downriver, uh, ripped them right off of the spuds, and, and took them downriver. Fortunately, no one was injured. But these things do come up, and as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, Mother Nature will win. So again, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of conclude with just saying that, you know, construction engineers, uh, you know, we have to work with a base set of guidelines. Uh, but most, of, most critical is that we need to work with our contracted clients and make sure that we can educate them on all the pros and cons of the minimum design levels so that they can evaluate the risk. And that risk and the level of risk they take is, is reflected in the cost of their bid. So again, calculated risks are risks with a plan. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Josh, and he's going to talk about some bridge demolition. And that's probably the one that is the most uh, uh, where the most conversation occurs with uh, impact and risk. So Josh, take over, buddy. All right. So um, Dave had, uh, ha has discussed some of the items uh, in, more broad, in more broad terms um, that I'm going to be getting into here. Um, and that has to do uh, more specifically with demolition analysis for bridges and, and, and redecking. Now, um, the reason that this is important um, is because um, as we all know, um, there are a lot of bridges in our current inventory that, that necessitate replacement. Uh, most projects that we work on not only uh, in, involve um, putting up a new structure, but also taking the old one down. Uh, the need for all of these bridge re replacements um, generates a need for safe demolition practices. And really, there isn't currently a formal code or guideline that allows for this. This is a NCHRP report that was published this uh, past year that um, is, a, is a survey of different DOTs and really calls, um, calls to action the fact that some kind of a, a document is needed. And we at Genesis are actually part of a group of uh, you know, talented uh, construction engineers from around the country working through ASCE and the Construction Institute. And we're actually currently uh, have, a, ha have a plan of trying to put together a, a set of best practices for demolition engineering. And the reason that um, we talk about this today and the reason it's, it's pertinent is because just like erecting a bridge, uh, a demolition analysis um, is basically just, just that in, in reverse. It's complicated because the structural resistance and stiffness of the structure changes depending on the stage that you're looking at. Um, and again, just like Dave had mentioned previously, um, some kind of or a, a standard method for evaluating these, these loads is not available, particularly with impact. Uh, sometimes, um, you know, it, it is common practice to use different impact values based on the deck removal method. Um, and again, the reason that this is important is because we're dealing with large machines here. An HS20 truck um, is about half the weight of a larger excavator that could be asked to be placed on a bridge that is, is not in its permanent condition. Not only is the weight um, comparison um, eye-opening, so is the longitudinal distribution. The actual spacing between HS20 truck is between 28 to 44 feet. Typical tumbler spacing of a uh, tracked excavator is around 15 feet. So you can see not only do you have larger loads, but you have those concentrated over shorter lengths, which just means that the structure is impacted uh, more greatly. 
So I mentioned different impact factors with different um, demo methods. Um, probably the most common method for deck removal is by use of a breaker or a hammer. Uh, it's preferred because it's quick, but it does have its disadvantages like damaging the flanges or the cross frames of the structure. The next method would be uh, removal of deck with a shear. Uh, this, this isn't quite as common, but it is, you, you will see shears all over the place um, on a demo site. Um, and not only can shears be used to remove the deck, but they can also be used to uh, pluck out girders if the uh, excavator has the capacity, and it can be used to process material on the site as well. So the last um, and another more common uh, deck removal method is panelized rem removal with a slab crab or a bucket with a thumb. This is the most time consuming um, because you have to pre-cut the deck ahead of time, but um, it's, it's done in a more controlled manner. So when you are analyzing a bridge to be demolished, as I mentioned, stage specific capacities go along with stage specific demands. There are changes to the structural and integrity of the bridge that you um, have, are aware of and that we plan for. An example would be pre-cutting cross frames between girders that are going to be removed. Another example would be pre-cutting or scoring the deck for prior to panelized removal. Both are changing the structural capacity of the bridge from its um, original design or when the, um, you know, the equipment originally gets on the bridge. Sometimes when we change the structural in integrity of a bridge during demolition, it's unintentional. You can see a photo here of the uh, deck removal um, of, a, um, of a steel girder span where the operator wasn't so delicate in, in, in removing the, the, the deck. And you can see we, we had referred to this uh, flange as a lasagna noodle as the photo came back to us, but a hammer was used for this deck removal, and, and that can... Uh, certainly uh, not be argued that that girder has the same capacity that it did before uh, the, the, the flange was uh, damaged like that. Um, another thing to consider when uh, looking at demo analyses and, and reviewing these from any level is that the direction of deck removal, especially for continuous spans, matters a great deal. Uh, this is an example uh, schematic of a three-span bridge that we worked on. The plan was to remove deck from, from right to left. Out in the field, the, the plan wasn't, wasn't followed exactly, and uh, span was, the, the deck was removed from, from left to right. That may not seem like that big of a deal if you're on top of the bridge, but if you really study the structure and go underneath, you'll see there's a reason that we did that. And the reason is, is, is exactly what, what happened out in the field. That bearing uh, next to span one actually went into uplift and, and got so much uplift force that it actually sheared through the pin. And instead of a, uh, a three-span continuous bridge, it turned into a two-span continuous bridge with a cantilever as long as span one. That not only um, um, obviously scared a lot of people when that pop happened, but it also, uh, it also increased the positive bending demand in span two and caused the girder system uh, to begin to roll. And this was over a uh, highway, so uh, traffic had to be shut down. Another uh, consideration uh, for changing the structural integrity unintentionally, this was a, another quick example and story here from a steel girder bridge that was demolished. It was four spans, um, steel deck, or sorry, steel girders, composite deck, and the end abutments were made integral after the abutments were poured. An excavator went through, removed the deck, no problem, didn't have engineering associated with the demo of the deck, but it, it went off without a hitch. The deck was gone. The contractor went, went home for the night. The integral abutments were still there, um, which essentially pinned the bridge at each end. And the next morning when the contractor came back, the sun came out and started heating up the structure, and the bridge began to elongate. And there was nowhere for it to go. Both of the ends were still constrained. And the result was a, a, a buckled system and uh, a situation where the girder almost rolled off the rocker bearings and when you really could have big, big problems. So in summary, um, we bring this up and include this as part of this presentation because demolition is often an overlooked part of the um, bridge replacement process. And just because it's, um, it's not the shiny new bridge, the analysis can be uh, just as complicated as erection engineering and the, um, at times the risk can be higher. So again, our goal is to establish some minimum requirements uh, to increase the quality and the safety across the industry. But again, it is a, it is a fun venture to be in and one that we should all um, appreciate a little bit more. So with that, I'll turn it back to Dave who's going to wrap things up. All right, thanks, Josh.
So, uh, just some you know final thoughts and conclusions from uh, from a construction engineer's perspective. In a perfect world, uh, design engineers need to be experts in design, and then they need to be aware of construction engineering challenges. Construction engineers need to be experts in the temporary works, but maintain an understanding of AASHTO and other design co uh, codes. In our mind, design engineers and owners should not be afraid to reach out to construction engineering firms and even contractors. Um, you know, if there are some general conversations up front, you know, on possible erection methods and schemes, that's a good thing. And if a design engineer owner wants a more thorough review of the uh, erection sequence, you know, there should be a proper budget allowance during the scoping and phasing. And, and rather it be uh, and not be a secondhand thought or check at the end of the projects when the plan's already developed. And as Josh was trying to point out, you know, ASHTO could formalize, uh, you know, the categories of steel girder bridges in, in the more erection category. Because right now it's mainly up to the DOTs or it's not defined very well at all. On the design bid build contract world, you know, as we mentioned, the contractor is responsible for erecting all those parts and pieces and achieve a fully erected structure. Uh, it's our thought that, you know, the contract plan should provide a design that is stable and safe once the superstructure is fully erected. Uh, contract plans should provide a viable suggested erection sequence, depending on the, the complexity, or at least that minimum deck pour sequence. And of course, if a contractor decides to stray from any suggested uh, in the erection sequence, you know, all the en engineering as expected would be on them. And then finally, you know, temporary works are not permanent structures. Uh, temporary works, you know, do support the structure in their most unstable periods of time, as well as some of the equipment needed to erect those structures. Um, you know, temporary works may only need to be around for 15 minutes or could work as long as 6 to 12 months or, or even longer in the case of trestles, barges, and other supporting uh, types of uh, truss or other supporting uh, false work that uh, supports equipment. But the most important thing is that the design loads and guidelines of temporary works are not as well defined as those for the permanent structure. So this needs to be recognized by the engineer of records when developing uh, any type of erection submittal specifications and or reviewing submittals. If there are things that you specifically want to see, uh, then those need to be noted in those specifications. And if there are design loads that you know, a contractor specifically needs to, to maintain or hit, then those should be noted in the, in the uh, uh, plans. Otherwise, what you're going to have is three or four different contractors taking three or four different risk levels, uh, and when it comes to the middle process, there may be some disagreements. So with that, Nathan, uh, I think we're done. I think we'll turn it back over to you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dave and Josh, for that great presentation. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move into uh, a questions portion of, of, the, of the webinar. So uh, just a reminder again to the audience, uh, we have had questions coming in, but uh, if you have any questions that are lingering as you uh, contemplate these topics discussed by our, our speakers, uh, you can type those into the chat feature and we'll try to We'll try to get to those. Um, but first, before we get to the audience questions, we're going to go ahead and do a couple of polling questions that we are going to pose to the audience. And the first is on the screen there. This is a true-false statement. And the audience can select the answers they think are correct by selecting the, the proper radio button on their computer screen. So. The first, the first question is this, true or false? According to AASHTO specifications, the EOR is always required to provide, at a minimum, a deck pouring sequence. Is that statement true or false? 
again, the true or false statement, according to ASHTO specifications, the EOR is always required to provide, at a minimum, a deck pouring sequence. Looks like most of the answers have come in, so we're going to go ahead and see what the results say. So this is kind of interesting. Uh, we kind of have a split decision here. So we, about 57% of the audience thinks that that answer is false, and 43% think that's true. Now, Dave and Josh, what was the answer we were looking for on this question? Well, the answer we were looking for, and again, this is, this is, this is a great answer because this is a lot of the uh, answers you get with these type of uh, questions, but we were, we were looking for the answer true. Uh, we feel that, that uh, it, 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 is a, it, it is a minimum uh, requirement um, as expected through being able to, to, to study the deck pouring sequence. How would the contractor know what that deck pouring sequence would be unless you've uh, indicated that on the, on the plans? So again, this is a great answer because it is uh, because it is, um, again, it's, it's, it's one of those ambiguous issues that we wanted to focus on, and so I think this kind of sheds, sheds, sheds light on some of that. All right. Going to the next one. Uh, this, this is also a true-false statement, and it goes like this. During a design, bid, build process, owners and designers always contact the contracting community for opinions on how to build the proposed structure. Is that statement true or false? The statement is during a design bid build process, owners and designers always contact the contracting community for opinions on how to build the proposed structures. All right, it looks like many of the answers have come in. Let's go ahead and see what those results are. So this one is a little bit more of a unanimous decision. Most people think that that answer is false. Did they get that one right, guys? And, and I would say that those five people out there work for DOTs that do a great job getting with their contracting community before they set a, set a plans out for bid. <laughs> But yes, that is correct. Most of the time, it, there is not good communication on the design build, uh, bid build process. All right. So let's go ahead and move into the question and answer portion. And the first question is going to take us to slide 56. And this is where, uh, Dave, you were talking about these girders swaying from wind um, in the horizontal direction. And the question is, for flange lateral bending due to wind on bare steel, do construction engineers get into using second order analyses to analyze uh, such a condition? So a lot of times for our, from, from our perspective, speaking from uh, the Genesis standpoint, we will get into um, those uh, second order effects because the, fluctua the, the, the structure is so uh, flexible that um, those, those second order effects can be uh, pronounced at these critical stages. And that's really magnified on the longer stands with the deeper girders. They do have, and that don't have the lateral bracing, they do have the most exposure when, when it comes to wind. All right. Um, let's see, the next question, we're going to go to slide 126. This is a question about uh, resources. Um, the question is, can the presenters comment on design standards for scaffolding and other access sy systems that are typically used in bridge construction and demolition? Yeah, so, so one thing that John or Josh didn't mention was that uh, obviously OSHA uh, has a lot of governing uh, criteria with regards to some of those platforms, some of those work platforms and things like that. Um, a lot of times the contractors have their own safety people uh, that handle a lot of that. Uh, construction engineers like us will be asked to design some of the bigger platforms uh, and maybe check some of the internal calculations that are done by the contractors. But generally, that, that type of stuff is uh, worker safety, worker access related, and the contractors, engineers uh, handle a lot of that in-house. Uh, 
And again, they're, 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 they're making sure that they not only consider some of these things that Josh put on the slide, but they also have to make sure that they meet all of the OSHA spec, uh, spec, speculations and, and requirements. All right. Um, moving forward a little bit, um, slide 132, and this is where uh, the presentation gets into equipment loads and environmental loads um, that are considered. And there's a question, for Astro Strength 3 load combination, do construction engineers typically consider wind and deck placement loads simultaneously? Um, so as, as construction engineers, Typically, unless the deck pouring sequence, as shown in the plans or uh, indicated on the plans, uh, differs from what we are um, looking to evaluate, we don't we don't we don't run those um, sorts of analyses. But in that case, uh, we would, uh, with a, probably a more uh, controlled uh, wind than for permanent design. Um, but and, and if we would also use a wind associated with that uh, construction period duration. But yes, we would. We would use those simultaneously. All right. Uh, moving to slide 107 and continuing with that theme of uh, the wind during during erection uh, that you're talking about. Um, does this guidance on how much of a duration to consider during erection? Are you typically getting that information from the contractor, or do the owners usually have standards that they're looking for you to, for you to meet? I would say it's probably atypical to have an owner dictate uh, a duration. Um, most of those durations are, you know, coordinated with our contractors. Um, there are times when, you know, things happen in the construction world and things take a little longer than, than what maybe have predicted, and we have had to go back and you know, reevaluate some of the temporary works. If, for instance, uh, there was a material shortage or something in fabrication was going to require a little more time, and something that was going to be zero to six is now a six week to a year, we have had to go back and reevaluate it. But again, that kind of goes back to the, the risk reward of the time period. You know, if it's something that is known that's going to be there for a while, um, then, you know, that six weeks to a year covers quite a bit. Uh, but if we also know it's going to be a one-day pick, then that zero to six weeks gives us just that extra ability to, to, to you know, lessen the loads just a little bit just based on probability. But I would say that that's mainly a conversation between the contractors and their construction engineer. Okay. Um, question uh, about lateral bracing. Um, so for a steel eye girder bridge, is there a preferred location of lateral bracing near the top flange, bottom flange, or neutral axis? Does lateral bracing perform better at any specific location? Um, what do you guys think about when you make those types of decisions? So from um, the, the standpoint of uh, where to put the lateral bracing, if it is put on the bottom flange, you know, it, it, I, I think the question is, you know, asking if, if that can be, um, if that's not typically done because it can be a fatigue problem um, because those then start picking up on the, um, you know, on the main axis bending loads. Um, from, from our experience talking to designers, um, putting it near the top or at the neutral axis is more um, um, advantageous because of the fact that it's, it's uh, not in that um, uh, location where it's going to be picking up uh, main strong axis bending loads. All right. Um, question about wind acting on equipment. So what, what is the typical proposed amount of lateral load that is considered for the cranes and excavator equipment? So typically, we just look at the, we'll, we'll call it the affected area of the equipment and we will apply the wind loads that we, we, we would be applying for that particular duration or that particular pick. So if we were, for instance, looking at a crane with a girder on it and we knew the conditions, we would have some wind on that crane, especially if it's on, say, like a barge situation. Or if we knew that the piece of equipment was one of those transporters and they had tall towers on them, we would, we would you know, load that equipment just as if it was a permanent 
or a, a, a more permanent type of temporary false work, you know, like a tower or something like that. So we do account for it, um, but it, you know, part of the part of the thing with wind on equipment is that the duration sometimes is so small. So usually the equipment that gets more attention with the wind are the gantries uh, and the transporters that have those loads on them a little longer. And then you know the cranes, like Josh had mentioned, sometimes the cranes are hold cranes and they're holding something for a period of time. We'll take a look at you know the wind on the boom and things like that. All right. And we're going to do one one final question. We're a little over time here, uh, but there's a question in reaction to this uh, polling question, and the question is, how can we as owners solicit feedback on constructability pre-bid and design bid build jobs? Well, that, that's a great question, and uh, I'll, I will come at it speaking from the construction industry particularly the construction engineers out there. Um, a lot of times when we work with the, the non-private owners, so we'll say the DOT owners, uh, construction engineers are asked to either play one side of the fence or the other. So for instance, if a, a DOT would like our opinion on how to do constructability thought processes, um, we may be asked to get involved in that project but then as a construction engineer, we're limited to then, act, when it goes out to bid, work with contractors uh, to, to be on the bidding side of it. So, you know, if there was a way to create a process where maybe those thoughts and those questions came up and say the first 10, 15 percent of the design, and then you did ask those con contractor construction engineers uh, for those thoughts and opinions, then release us to be able to work with the contractors, that would be great. At the same time, you know, a lot of times uh, DOTs may ask contractors for their thoughts and opinions, and the contractors may give their thoughts and opinions, but they're not going to give away the whole story because depending on how that bid comes out, some of that story may be their, their, their edge on, the, on their competitors. So, it, you know, my thought would be that if you talk to the construction engineering community who has the pulse of the contractors, and allow them to work on both sides of the fence, release them real early in the design process so they can work with the contractors, that might be the best way. All right. Thank you for those answers, guys. Um, so we're out of time here, so we're going to cut things off there. But I just want to let everyone know who submitted questions that we did not get to all the questions uh, during this live portion. And, we will work with Dave and Josh uh, to respond to question askers um, who, whose questions we did not get to um, via email in the coming weeks.